be in by the end of May. Take a look on the website for the full directions and instructions and the categories for that competition. It should be a great uh, opportunity to show off what you've been able to do so far. I do want to just thank uh, Shauna Brown, who was uh, uh, instrumental in, in donating to us a number of high density foam pieces that uh, we're going to be able to use for our gardens in terms of being able to use kneelers. And uh, I'm going to distribute those to the, some of the people that are working on the gardens that we help to, to uh, maintain. And just to let you know that um, uh, Faye Collins has been under the weather, I'm going to say it that way, for a number of weeks. And Brian Gower will take over the lead for the team that's going to look after the Brooklyn Horticultural Garden at Harnwith and Montgomery in Brooklyn. Some of those home pieces will go to them. So we wish Faye every, a very speedy recovery. Uh, won't go to, into any details, but uh, she's, uh, um, we've, had, we've been forced to hand over the lead for the time being. Reminder for memberships, there's still, you still get your 10% discount at the number of the garden centers and other supporters of the Brooklyn Whitby Garden Club. So make sure you've got your, uh, your new cards. Talk to our, our membership lead, that's Eric Tineman and membership bwgc at gmail.com. Get you right to his, his uh, mailbox. We've been very successful with our rain barrel sales again this year. So far, we've got 41 sales of rain barrels, which is quite a good number. We, we make a small profit on each one of those, so that'll be going into our general coffers. Delivery for them will be in mid-May. They will be delivered right to your door in the Oshawa, Whitby, Brooklyn area. So there's information at, uh, with Jane Austen at Jane austin 000 at msn.com. So now let's turn it over to Sue Green for the Whitby and Bloom introduction of our tonight's speaker and topic. Over to you, Sue. Okay, thanks, Hans. Um, just a reminder that uh, we have one more seminar that will be a joint seminar between uh, the Brooklyn Whitby Horticultural Society or Garden Gordon Club and Whitby and Bloom. And that will be on Wednesday, May the 26th. It will be my brother, Mark Cullen, will be speaking about Beyond Beefsteak. So uh, we seem to have a, a bit of a food theme going along here what with uh, herbs tonight and of course veggies next, uh, next month. So uh, tonight I have the pleasure to introduce Conrad Richter of Richter Herbs located in Goodwood. In 1967, Conrad's parents started the herb growing and distribution business. And as a young child, he helped in the greenhouse and in the fields, as all kinds of kids of entrepreneurial families do. So he got his training from the ground up, so to speak. He has a master of science degree in botany from the University of Toronto. In my memory, Goodwood was known as the home of Richter Herbs. That was when I used to work in my family owned business, um, garden center business, but um, times changed with Eugene and Daniel Levy filming their acclaimed, acclaimed CBC and most recently Netflix hit show, Schitt's Creek in Goodwood. Now this might be a good thing for Richter Herbs as many tourists might just have stumbled on Conrad's company while checking out the sites. But for those of us tonight, I know that some folks who do not usually join us are here because they love cooking. And herbs have both become most integral to home cooking. So whatever the reason that you've joined us, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Conrad and go ahead, Conrad, take it away. Well, thank you very, very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, yes. okay, all right. All right, well, uh, thank you very much for that introduction, Sue. And uh, I'm really delighted to be part of, uh, you know, be here before the group and before the, uh, the society 
I didn't know that you're celebrating your 100th anniversary. That is an amazing achievement for, for a gardening club. I, I'm really thrilled for you and I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, we celebrated our 50th anniversary last year uh, of uh, our 50th catalog last year. So uh, I'm happy that we have shared 50 years at least together in the gardening business. So anyway, uh, um, I would like to uh, uh, get right into my slides and uh, I'm just going to find out, uh, figure out how to share my screen. Hang up, bear with me here. Okay, I believe I'm sharing the screen now. And that should be the first slide there. Can everyone see that? Um, Lara, can you see that? Yes, you're doing great, Conrad. Yep. Perfect okay. screen. <laughs> okay, all right. Let's 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 get rolling here. So I, I want to talk about uh, some of the more unusual herbs. Now we at Richter's grow an awful lot of different herbs. So we, of course, we grow all the popular herbs, you know, the oreganos and the rosemaries and the thymes and so on. But uh, we're, we're very well known for a wide selection of herbs, many of which you can't find anywhere, very, you know, very hard to find elsewhere. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about some of those, uh, you know, off the beaten track type of herbs. Um, uh, we, we, Richter sells and grows upwards of a thousand different varieties of herbs. And so, as many of them, uh, you'd be surprised. They may actually, you may know them as ornamental, or you may know them as vegetables, you may know them as trees, or you may even know them as weeds. But for us, they are medicinal plants, they're culinary plants, or they're aromatic plants. And that's that's what we've been focused in uh, on for the last 50 years. Well, let's go back to about that time, you know, uh, as was mentioned by Sue, that we got started back in the 60s, late 60s. Uh, what, was, what was the herb landscape back then? What, what, what did people know about herbs? Well, this was a typical spice wrap back then in the kitchen, and it's pretty sparse. You don't see very many herbs on here. You see some blends, you see some you know, garlic salt and onion salt and poultry seasoning and so on. And parsley flakes that were looking pretty brown, not, not too exciting, but this was a typical uh, spice rack back then. People just didn't know much about herbs. And if they grew anything live, anything uh, any live herbs, it might be this one. It would be parsley, but the moss curled type, the highly curled type, which is more decorative than it was for flavor. So it would be set as a garnish on a dish or on the side of a plate. But basically you set it aside and you dig into your food. You didn't really eat or use the flavors of this parsley. And these varieties were develop more for their decorative value than these curly leaf types. Or you might know spearmint or any of the mints, you might know where it, where it was grown. Uh, as a kid growing up in that time, I remember having upset stomachs and my mom would give me uh, mint tea and, I, and I, many of my friends uh, and their families would do the same thing. So they knew mint at that time as well. And among the few other herbs that people might have known in the late 60s was this one, and cannabis, of course. And nowadays we laugh, we might laugh about that, uh, but in those days, of course, it was a, a highly prohibited plant, and very dangerous to, to be found uh, possessing or growing this plant. But nowadays, uh, we have a very different attitude about this plant, and I I, I dwell on this uh, with this slide here simply because it highlights how much we have changed in the way we regard the plants from their medicinal or health giving properties. How many people today know uh, somebody or know or them or, or are themselves using 
uh, various uh, cannabis products for health reasons, to help them to sleep, how to cope with these uh, uh, pains and sufferings and so on. So this has opened up the eyes of many, many people uh, about the powers of plants. And uh, so when I talk about you know, culinary herbs, you know, I want you to know that the culinary herbs are also medicinal plants as well. They're there and they've originally been added to foods not so much for their flavors, but for their health given properties. Well, uh, back, in the, back in the 60s, when my parents uh, uh, opened up a nursery, they were principally growing, uh, you know, typical bo box plants and geraniums, you know, tomato plants, petunias and, and patients and so on. But my, my parents coming from Central Europe and having grown up with herbs, using herbs in their cooking and using herbs for, for you know, home medicine, uh, were, you know, wanted to grow them for, theirself, for themselves, my mom in particular. And she asked my father, who's on the left in that, that lower picture, uh, to order some seeds in from Germany and start growing them. And so they had, uh, my parents had a, a set aside a small corner of their greenhouse for the herbs, all labeled with German labels, uh, uh, labels with German names on them. And none of it was intended for sale. It was all intended for growing in their own garden and for their own use. They figured that no one would, you know, no one would be interested in these plants. They certainly didn't have interesting flowers or didn't look like they belonged in a, in a garden at that time. So they didn't even try to sell them. But as the people walked through the greenhouse looking for their geraniums and looking for their uh, you know, impatience and so on, they saw these plants and they asked, they started asking questions. And my mom would, to the extent that she could, explain how they were used, why she had them in the greenhouse. And before long, we realized that people were asking to buy these plants and take them home and plant them in their garden. And within a year or so, we, my parents decided to devote one of the central benches of the greenhouse, about 20 or 30 feet of it, for about 60 or 70 different varieties of herbs that they were growing at that time. And the Toronto Star got wind of that and devoted a whole page to these herbs. And that really got us going, got my parents going. And it, it led to the first catalog that came out in 1970 was just a listing of herbs that had about 300 varieties. Of course, your common common herbs were there, uh, common uh, culinary herbs were there, the mints, the parsleys, thymes, basils, etc. but also quite a few medicinal plants were in there. And that was quite a revelation for the gardening industry. And I think still a lot of people were so, uh, regarded us and what my parents were doing at that time with a certain amount of suspicion being that they, they wondered and often said that these plants don't belong in a garden. Well, by the 1980s, herbs had become more popular and we, we call them the happy dozen. These are the herbs that people gravitated to, wanted, new, you know, uh, saw in recipes, wanted to grow them, didn't want to use the, you know, the insipid dried stuff that they found in the supermarket. They wanted to grow their own, have the fresh herbs. And we call them, as I say, the, the happy dozen herbs, the basils, the chives, the corianders, the dills, and so on. And uh, even to this day, these are still the most popular, among mostly, most of the most popular herbs are on this list. But today, the herb, the, the, the herb world has gone way beyond those happy dozen herbs to the point now where people are growing uh, upwards of you know, a dozen or more different types of basil or thymes or sages or, or going into uh, uh, starting to grow herbs from other ethnic uh, cultures and cuisines such as Vietnamese herbs and the Latin American herbs, the Indian herbs, the Thai herbs, and so on. And 
they have really truly enriched our lives in so many ways. And this book here came out just a couple of years ago, highly recommended, really focuses on some of the interesting and unusual herbs that you can grow. Uh, so if you get a chance to pick up this book, you know, you should do it. All right, let's get into some of the herbs that, uh, that, uh, that I pulled together. I could have pulled many other herbs that I, you know, with the limited time that I have, I've uh, selected some a dozen or more uh, lesser known herbs that I wanna, wanna speak about. Here's one that you may not have heard of before, but it certainly is deserving, not only in a herb garden, but also just in a regular perennial border, because this is one of the most ornamental native plants of North America. It is a native of the prairie provinces and the prairie states. And it's just that it's also known as licorice mint. And it's because the leaves have a very strong licorice or anise flavor, and it can be used in tea. And here you can see it's used uh, just you know as a regular tea. It can be in a dried form or in a fresh form, just, just uh, uh, brewed with uh, boiling water poured over it, let stand for five or 10 minutes, and it's a wonderful tea. The, uh, the uh, uh, indigenous people showed the pioneers and the settlers how to use this plant. They, the, the indigenous people had used this for many, many years, principally for uh, to settle the stomach, right? much like with what we use spearmint and the other mints for. And it's an incredibly, as a, a colorful plant, it will bloom for months, throughout months to the summer, right into the fall. And it is one, of, it is an absolute magnet for pollinators, pollinators of all kinds. The, each one of those tubes is an individual flower or floret on this flower spike. Each one of those tubes is loaded in nectar, sweet nectar, and the pollinators will gravitate to this. In fact, it's such a good pollinator uh, uh, plant that beekeepers will grow this by the acre, this uh, anisysa and all the various varieties of it, I will grow it by the acre in order to encourage uh, uh, you know, their, their bees, uh, to provide food for their bees. And it, the pollinator for, uh, or sorry, it's a magnet for other pollinators like moths and butterflies and even hummingbirds. And it comes in a variety of colors. So definitely a, well, a, 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 word, a, a plant well worth putting in your, in your garden, whether it's a flower garden or a herb garden. Here's one of my mother's favorite herbs uh, because she would take it every day in the form of a tea. This is lemon balm. It is a member of the mint family. And the mint family is one of our most important families of herbs. In fact, the plant that we just saw, the anise hyssop, is a member of the mint family. So the, anise, uh, uh, so the lemon balm, as you can see, it kind of resembles mint. Doesn't grow quite like it though. Uh, regular mint tends to spread. You're probably, if you've grown it, you're well familiar with the rhizomes or what they call stolons. Uh, these stems that spread horizontally and create uh, a large patches of mint. Well, this one doesn't spread in that form, but will spread by seeds and will pop up in different parts of the garden, but it is not considered invasive. And it has in its fresh form an intense lemon scent. Now, when you dry it and you can dry it and make the tea from it, uh, which is what my mother would do, uh, it loses it, most of its lemon scent, but it is still an incredible tea herb. Here you can see it's in both in a, in a, in a cool drink and in, in, in a warm uh, tea drink, again, as an infusion like the uh, anise hyssop. The thing about lemon balm, which is really great, and this is why my mom loved to have this, and she, would, she had a, 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 a kind of a ritual of taking it, uh, this making and, and taking this tea every day. 
she would do it she would have it in the afternoon but what's great about this tea is that it both is up um, it will uh, both uh, calming on one hand and uplifting when you're when you're when you're tired or exhausted so it is kind of a modulating herb in a way so uh, having a, a cup of tea when you're stressed out this is a perfect one to have or when you're really tired in the morning you want to wake up this is a great herb to have a great tea to have and my uh, many customers still come into the greenhouse and they reminisce with me and saying that you know uh, I came in uh, many years ago and your mom served me and she took me around the greenhouse to show me, you know, all these different herbs that I should grow. And she would ultimately talk about this herb. And then she would say, why don't you come over to my house and I'll, I'll brew you a cup of tea. And so they would go over, come over to my mom's house and they would have the tea. And uh, these people just always remember that, have a great memory and keep telling me about that experience. Well, here's another plant that you probably think of as an ornamental, and you probably you may well have it already in your garden, uh, but it is also a herb, and it is an aromatic plant. Uh, it is also a tea herb, and it is also a native of North America. The indigenous people knew this plant very well and frequently used the tea for a variety of ailments. Again, digestive was often, uh, uh, for a digestive reasons, they would take this tea. Uh, it has an interesting history though. Um, if you remember uh, during, during the early years of the, uh, the, uh, the Revolutionary War in the United States, uh, it before, it, before the war actually broke out and the, the colonials uh, rebelled against the British, especially it was principally a, about uh, the cost of tea and the control of the uh, the tea that came from from the from Asia that the British uh, controlled the market of, uh, the the colonials uh, and the settlers uh, rebelled against the, the British policy and threw the tea of, into the sea and uh, what we now know we, we remember as the Boston Tea Party and. Well, uh, the the colonials then had a problem. Well, what do you do now? You get, uh, what are you going to do for your daily cup of tea? And they uh, ended up adopting this plant and species related to it for their daily cup of tea. It is also known as bee balm, and um, uh, and they learned that from the Oswego, principally the Oswego Indians in New York State. And uh, interesting plant that uh, because of its flavor, the flavor and the aroma is what we call bergamot. And it resembles, or well here, by the way, is a, you can see their commercial products made from the bergamot flowers and the leaves to make uh, commercial tea. This is a, from uh, a tea mix uh, from Germany. And you can see that the flowers are incorporated in, in the tea mix and, and impart the beautiful color. But the name bergamot, I believe, comes from the use of bergamot, the citrus bergamot in Earl Grey tea. Now Earl Grey tea, as you all know, uh, has a very distinct flavor. It's not only black tea from, from Asia, but it has a special flavor added to it called the citrus bergamot, which is actually a citrus tree from southern, uh, southern uh, Italy, in the Calabria and southern parts of India, Italy. So the peel of this citrus bergamot orange is used to produce the oil that flavors Earl Grey tea. And it so happens that the bergamot plant that is native to North America has a fragrance and oil that resembles this plant. And which is probably the reason why the settlers and the colonials quickly took to that plant as their substitute for tea back in the 
early days in their protests against the British. And of course, bergamot comes in many different colors and forms, purple, pinks, whites, and especially the red colors. And like the anise herself, it is an incredible magnet for, for uh, pollinators. That's why it's one of the reasons why one of its common names is bee balm. And each one of those florets is loaded in nectar. Okay, changing gears a little bit. Uh, chives, most of you are familiar with chives and uh, it is one of the happy dozen herbs that we talked about earlier. And it's hardy perennial, it's an ornamental in its own right. Uh, and the leaves that are not flowering, the non-flowering leaves are what you use for fresh chop in salads, on eggs and omelets and many other places, salad dressings, wonderful. But not as many people know that these flowers are also ha also have a great flavor, and you can you can pull off those individual florets of each of these flower heads and sprinkle them on a salad, and it gives the, both the flavor and the color. Uh, uh, adds interesting color to your salad, to really brightens up your salads and really makes it interesting. Now, if you're going to do that with regular chives, you better do that pretty early because if you leave it too long, the seeds start forming at each at the base of these flowers, and they get quite hard, and they're not so wonderful to be chewing on if you throw them in your salad. So you want those flowers uh, when they're just opening up, and then you get very easy to break uh, to pull each pull these flowers off and sprinkle them on the salad. And I should add that one of the introductions, one of the many unique introductions that we introduced over those 50 years that we've, more than 50 years that we've been selling her, uh, is a variety called perfusion chives. And it happens to be a sterile chive. And what that means is that it cannot produce seeds. It cannot cross-pollinate and cannot produce seeds. And so the flowers never produce a hard seed at the base of the flowers. And so you can use these flowers for longer in your salad. And in the 1980s, I, you know, it was, it was one of my personal uh, fun things to do is to look around the world, order in catalogs from all over the world and see what interesting plants I could, we could add to the herb collection that we had. And I got a Japanese catalog, and in there they had uh, this, this allium, allium tuberosum. It wasn't called garlic chives, it was called, I forget now what it was called actually in English, but of course it had a Japanese name. And uh, they didn't use it like we use regular chives, they used it they use the flower and stems and they steam them in stir fries uh, for, you know, for, in their cuisine. And uh, I thought, well, okay, let's try it. Let's go, let's order some in. Let's grow it in the greenhouse. Let's see what this plant is like to grow. And is it something that we could add to our collection? And sure enough, it was a really fantastic find. It has flat leaves as opposed to the hollow uh, leaves of the regular chives and much more intense flavor and it has these white flowers and like the other herb we talked about another magnet for pollinators and here you can see the various types of chives in the foreground you see the traditional onion chives with the hollow leaves and then in the middle you see the flat leaf garlic chives and then you see uh, there are a number of other chives, look-alike plants that are used much like chives. In this case, uh, one that we call Welsh onion that can also be used like chives. And to the Orientals, uh, they use the garlic chives uh, in here, in this case, uh, steamed dumplings. Well, let's change gears again. Uh, now we're coming back to Europe, uh, Central Europe in particular, a plant that you, probably most of you have never heard of before, 
called Sala Burnett. <clears throat> and it, it was known throughout Europe. Uh, certainly the British knew about it, the English knew about it, uh, but it is a favorite and important herb of Central Europe. Um, it's a hardy perennial and uh, it's very easy to grow. It's uh, well behaved. It doesn't spread all over the place. Uh, <clears throat> and interestingly, it has a nut cucumber flavor used only in its fresh form. It's a beautiful plant. It could even be used as a garnish, like that moss curled parsley we've seen before. Imagine this on a dish just, just for its visual appeal. Uh, but each one of those leaves has that really lovely nut cucumbery flavor. And it is a key ingredient in a famous green sauce that is uh, uh, used in, in the Frankfurt region of Germany. So these, uh, this sauce would be made of seven different fresh herbs, such as borage, chervil, cress, parsley, sorrel, chives, and the salad burnet, as you can see this up at the top, all blended together with sour cream. And this, sour, this sauce would be served cold over hard boiled eggs or boiled potatoes. And it's a, a real delicacy of that part of, of Germany. But this, this flavor combination, the lemon, uh, sorry, the, the cucumber nut combination is really unique. You don't find that too often in the plant world. And I think it's really one of those herbs that is underutilized and underappreciated here in the West. Here is the same salad burnet as a pesto. Great pesto can be made with this plant. There's another herb from Central Europe uh, that uh, uh, I think is very much underappreciated. And it's one of the easiest plants, herbs that you could ever think to grow. It grows quite tall. It can get six, five, six feet tall. It has this leaf that looks kind of like celery leaf, very closely related. It belongs to the same family as celery, the same family as parsley, as carrots, as cilantro. It's one of, one, of the, one of the most important families in the herb world, in the culinary herb world. So lovage is also known as Maggie plant. And it, is, it has a strong celery flavor, but it's very, it's, it, it has more to it than that. And it is, a, it is principally used in Central Europe for soups and stews. When you think about a stew or a soup and you would, you know, put some meat in it, you maybe put a little bit of, uh, you know, some other veggies in there, some herbs and spices, salts and so on. And quite often you might be a bit disappointed that it sort of feels, it doesn't feel, you know, well-rounded flavor. It doesn't feel like it's filled in right. This plant, lovage, or also known as Maggie plant, is the, the missing ingredient. It is the, the flavor that ties it all together and gives you that really rich body and flavor for fabulous soups and stews. And in fact, you can, in some specialty stores, you can find these cubes called Maggie, uh, which is a kind of a, a stock, uh, solid stock, that has this plant as a key flavoring in it. Now, the great thing about this is that it is, well, you can see it has a really lush, uh, um, luscious leaves. It's uh, intensely flavored, uh, just a wonderful plant to work with, uh, both in the kitchen and in the garden. Uh, here you can see it in, uh, uh, in a soup here. There's typical soup with boiled potatoes and, 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 uh, and other ingredients. And one, one of the great things about this plant 
is that it is one of the first plants to come up in spring. This is actually a picture of it from about March, one of the first things that comes up after, after winter. Now here you can see that uh, the stems and the leaves are all purple, and that's because they're, uh, they, they're, uh, there's a, a pigment called anthocyanin that is generated. You see the anthocyanin, the purple anthocyanin is very common in plants. It's, a, it's an indicator of stress. Some plants, if you let them go dry in the middle of the summer for too long, uh, uh, they will sometimes turn purple because uh, they produce the anthocyanin as a, as, as a stress signal. Well, uh, these plants, because they're coming up so soon, so early in the spring, and there's still frost hitting them every night, they're producing that anthocyanin. But before long, when the weather warms up, all of those stems and all the leaves will unfold in, in a familiar green form. But even at this early stage, you can use them in cooking and in soups. You can use them fresh chops and salads and a lot of other ways. So this is a great herb I, uh, that I recommend that you consider putting in your herb garden. Now, one of the things that we have done over the years, I did mention that we, we've introduced a lot of interesting herbs to the North American herb market. Um, this is one of them. This is a, a plant that was never used or never marketed uh, for herbal use. It was marketed strictly as a ornamental plant. I found it in a, in a perennial seed catalog uh, in Europe. And I knew that this was related to one of our important herbs called sorrel, which is known as uh, Rumex acetosis or Rumex scatatus. And I thought, well, Rumex sanguinis, uh, that sounds kind of interesting. Let me order some seeds in and let's try them in our greenhouse. Let's see if, well, maybe they are not just ornamental, but they're also uh, edible and can be used in cooking. And sure enough, the leaves are just as wonderful in soups, and salads in particular as regular sorrel, but with this wonderful color. And today you will find this variety in many catalogs around the world and sold as a herb, not as a, as a perennial flower. So you can see it in a salad mix. It's great color, wonderful, along with the other uh, colorful ingredients. Great flavor as well. It really livens up the, the, the taste of the salad. You know, lettuce doesn't really have a lot of flavor. Um, and so these, a little bit of uh, bloody dock mixed in will, will give you that, that, hmm, that special, that special new flavor, something that really perks up the, the palate. All right, here's another herb that we introduced to North America and to the world. As you know, as you may know, uh, the United States for many, many, many years, ever since Castro took over in Cuba, uh, had a, imposed an embargo on Cuba and Americans couldn't travel to Cuba at all. But of course they read about the famed mojito, the mojito cocktail. But they could, they tried to emulate it. They used other mints, but it was never quite the same. It was never, it never worked quite as well. Canada, uh, much, um, much, uh, we, we have much to owe to Pierre Elliott Trudeau, uh, maintained relations with Cuba and allowed Canadians to travel to Cuba. And one Torontonian, quite a few years ago, was uh, waiting for her flight back to Toronto and Havana Airport and ordered a mojito. And in the mojito was, was a sprig of this mint and enjoyed it so much, she decided to sneak this little sprig 
and a piece of tissue paper in her baggage and bring it back to Toronto. And soon after she arrived, she called us up and asked, would you blow this thing? I'm in love with this mojito mint, and it's the only it's the only authentic mint that you can use to make mojito. Would you please blow it for us? And she came up, brought her little one little sprig, and we started blowing it. And ever since then, it became one of our most popular plants in our catalog, and is now found all over the world as mojito mint. Here we are with the mojito cocktail. You can make the mojito mocktail as well without alcohol. It's just a wonderful plant to have if you are into uh, cocktails and mocktails. All right, how about this one? Another one of the, uh, the happy dozen herbs, the sage. Now, I want to talk about sage because it's a little bit, quite of an interesting plant. It's more interesting than you might realize. There's an old saying about sage, and I, I remember researching this stuff way back in the 70s and 80s and, uh, and kind of laughing about some of the, you know, the old wives tales or the old sayings about some of these plants. Well, there's a saying about this sage that goes like this. How can a man die if he has sage in his garden? How can a man die if he is growing sage in his garden? And I, you know, at those days I was, uh, you know, a university student and I was into science and logic and, you know, you know I, I, I really appreciated the scientific method and I read this thing and I thought, oh, what does this mean? This is silly. What is, I mean, how can a man die if they had gro sage growing in their garden? It didn't make any sense to me at all. It was a reason for me to kind of discount some of these old sayings, those old traditions. I have a very different opinion about that now. I changed 180 degrees on that. And let me tell you about this plant. In recent decades, research has been conducted on sage, and it has been shown to be an incredible source of antioxidants. So these are substances that help to preserve cellular structure, among other things. And not only that, to the extent the research has been done, it has shown that when animals are given sage in their diet, they live longer. They actually live longer. And that really hit me. I remember that old saying, and here we are now, decades later, finding out where that saying came from. This plant helps you to live longer because it helps to preserve cellular structure. And all the variants of that same species, salvia officinalis. Officinalis is Latin for official, meaning that it is the one used for medicine. Here yet, or there, or just that one is the golden leaf form, so it's also decorative, or the purple leaf form. Okay. All the same species, all with the same flavors, used for, for stuffings in particular, but for many other ways, can be used as a gargle if you have a sore throat. Uh, it's one of the best ingredients, uh, best teas to make and use as a gargle to control. Uh, the bacteria infection, strep throat, and so on. And here's another form of that sage. So, you know, I have a theory, and I don't think I'm the one that came up with it, but I've, I've adopted it. And that is that many of these culinary herbs are have become associated with certain foods or in our diet or in our cuisines, but they weren't added for flavor in the first place. They were added for medicinal reasons and only became associated flavors later. A perfect example is thyme. Thyme has one of the most effective antiseptic substances known to man called thymol. It's an oil present in the leaves. 
And in the days before refrigeration, they, it, in order to preserve the meat, you would take fresh thyme and rub it into the meat to keep it from going bad. And that association between the meat and the thyme has now become a long, a, a, a deeply ingrained uh, combination then you can't make a steak, proper steak, without putting thyme on it. And there are many, many other examples. I could spend a whole session just on those uh, uh, original health benefits of these, these plants that we use in our, in our everyday cuisine. All right, I talked about some of the introductions that we, we at Richter's have uh, bought to the herb world, and this is one of them too. Uh, this one we introduced in the, in, the, in the 1980s. It happened to be, uh, it, hap it, it, was in one, it, it, it was in one of our many test seed boxes where it's seeds that we bring in from all over the world. In this case, from a botanical garden in I think Finland. And in that, what came up in that little test seed box was a, quite a few different seedlings, but there were only there were two, only two, that had a very particular orange scent. Not only did they have this wonderful orange scent, but they had a wonderful mat growing uh, habit. This orange spice thyme forms wonderful dense uh, um, mats, uh, ground cover mats. You can grow it in the middle of a lawn and it will outcompete the weeds. I've seen it choke out uh, weeds like plantain and dandelion. And, and you can mow it. And unlike some of the other creeping times, it doesn't form woody stems. So you can walk with your bare feet on it. And it's when you do so, up comes a rush of, of orange scent. It's an incredible plant. And we introduced it, and now it's one of our best selling plants that we have. And the business about scents, you might wonder well, how is it possible for a time to have the orange scent? Or how is it possible that lemon, a basil, would have the lemon scent, or a geranium would have the orange scent, as this Prince of Orange geranium does. How is it possible that the scent that we know with the orange citrus, or the lemon citrus, or the rose bush, or the coconut plant, how is it possible that these scents are also found in other plants? Because sometimes like, people Wonder, I'm sure people are wondering that we are practicing GMO with genetic modification. Well, no, we're not. These are natural, these are plants with these scents naturally. And here's a plant from Chile, one of my personal favorite lemon plants, lemon verbena, wonderful for tea, but it's unfortunately one of the few herbs that I'm talking about today that is not hardy, so you can only grow it as either as an annual or you bring it in for the winter. It comes from Chile, one of the most incredible lemon scent. I actually think this is has a finer lemon scent than, than the lemon itself. But they all have what we call the component oils. So when you take that lemon scent of the, of the, uh, from the lemon peel, of a lemon fruit, uh, that oil, when you break it down, is composed of a whole series of component oils. It is in fact an alphabet, an alphabet of scents. And when you combine the letters of this alphabet, you get words. You get the word, you get the lemon scent, you get the orange scent. You get the rose scent. You get all of the different scents are composed of an alphabet of scents. And each one of these components of those scents is, is controlled by the genetics of the plant. Now, here's the point, uh, the thing I would like to point out. 
on the left, you see the component oils of the lemon, of the lemon. And on the right, you see the component oils of the lemon verbena plant that I talked about just a moment ago in the previous slide that comes from Chile. The asterisk components are common to the two plants. So that is why lemon verbena has the lemon scent, the overall lemon scent, but it has a different mix. And when you smell it, it smells more uh, floral. And you can see that it has the component oil geranium, which is from the scent of geranium, associated with the scent of geranium and other oils. So it has a little bit more of a floral lemon scent to it. But as you can see, how you can get all these component oils right across the plant kingdom. It's just a matter of combining the right letters together and getting those scents, the right words. All right, let's change gears. We're changing gears a lot here, but I want to cover and you know, give you a, a nice little tour through the garden. And here we're going to talk a bit about a medicinal plant. I haven't talked much about the medicinal plant. I've talked about the medicinal properties of even our culinary herbs, uh, but uh, this one here is one of the classical medicinal plants. In fact, it is probably one of the very first medicinal plants known to man. It is so important as a medicinal plant that it was named, uh, let me just go here, the, uh, you see that the Latin name is Artemisia Pontica. Now Artemisia is in honor of, oops, I'm gonna go into the wrong one, uh, in honor of the Greek goddess Artemis, who is the twin sister of Apollo. And she was the goddess of the wilderness and of the hunt and of the forest and she knew the forest herbs, and she knew a lot about you know, herbal medicine. And she taught a Chiron, the centaur, who is widely recognized in Greek mythology as the real father of herbal medicine. And among the most important herbs was that, that wormwood, this plant here. Now this plant grows, you can find different species of Artemisia growing all throughout the Central Asian uh, republics and, and beyond further east across the steppes. You can, there's some pictures I've seen of the, of the Russian steppes that are just solid Artemisia. Now, why did this become one of the most important medicinal plants, one of the first most important medicinal plants? Well, it is what we call a vermifuge. A vermifuge is a plant that expels worms from the gut. Now, in our age of highly regulated meat supply, government expected, refrigerated, well, well, you know, you know, well cared for meat supply. We don't have to worry so much about parasites in our meat and our meat. But a hundred years ago, parasites in your meat and before was a serious problem. Imagine ten thousand years ago, the hunters and gatherers crossing the steppes through. Russia, what is now known as Russia, across the, across the, the uh, Central Asian republics into Europe. They would hunt and they would eat the meat and they would get sick from parasites and they would feel awful. Somebody, probably by accident, tried or tried some of the herbs growing profusely throughout that area and found immediately felt a lot better because this kills those parasites and became incredibly important medicinal plant to the point that today we still take this herb in the form of vermouth 
and other related liqueurs that you can buy today at the LCBO. Vermouth is actually one of the names for wormwood. That's what vermouth is. It actually means wormwood. And wormwood became, was, um, was first used as a, as a, as a tea with water, with boiling water, but they found that it was better to use alcohol. And so the wormwood would be steeped in alcohol and would be used like a tincture and could be used as a medicine throughout the year, anytime somebody suffered from digestive distress. So here you can see how a tradition that probably goes back at least 5,000, maybe 10,000 years and beyond is still with us today. And, oh, and I should go back. The wormwoods today are still an important uh, um, ornamental plant. You find many different forms of, of, of wormwood. Some of you may be familiar with Silver King, Silver Mound, and a number of other uh, uh, Artemisia forms. They're all closely related and have similar medicinal properties. All right, here's another uh, important medicinal herb. And some of you probably know it as an, uh, an again, as an, an ornamental plant, calendula. It's an annual herb, but it's one of the few annual herbs that are commonly grown that is actually hardy. It's frost tolerant and will often reseed itself. It grows about a foot and a half upwards to two feet tall. And it's covered with flowers through most of the summer once it starts blooming. It's a wonderful plant just for the garden alone, but these flowers are edible and more importantly, are really important for in cosmetics. They are, have a powerful healing property to, to the skin. So people, do you find many cosmetics are incorporating calendula uh, into, uh, into them for their healing effects. And you can make your own homemade ointments and skin you know, cosmetics uh, very simply using um, beeswax, for instance, and other similar uh, oil-based uh, or fat-based products. You can also dry the flowers and use them as a substitute for saffron. They don't have the flavor as the very expensive saffron. It comes from uh, principally from Spain and Portugal, but it gives the same color to rice, great in rice dishes, and provides the health benefit. And you can use the, the, the calendula flowers fresh in salad. Great, adds color and adds a bit of flavor. You also see in this mix here, some nasturtium, you see some corn flowers, uh, and uh, you even see some salvias in the salad. Wonderful salad to eat. And this is a, this is a calendula, a new calendula. Actually, it's not a new calendula, but it's new because it hasn't been in the North American market for many, many years, uh, but was, was introduced from Europe back in the 1930s, and then sort of was lost to, to cultivation but we've brought it back, uh, the radial cal calendula. It's more of a double or double, uh, more frilly type of uh, calendula, a lot more florets uh, that you can use in, uh, for cooking and for medicinal use. All right, here's a watercress. If you, got, if you are uh, regulars uh, out on the trails, especially those uh, here up in, uh, in the north part of Durham, uh, you'll, you'll occasionally find this plant growing in the shallow water at the edge of ponds or in running water, the watercress. And of course, you find uh, fresh watercress uh, offered for sale at the green grocery. Well, watercress is a great salad herb and has that distinctive uh, uh, peppery flavor. And you can grow it in your garden. You do not need running water or still water like this to grow it. it will, it's quite happy growing in a regular garden as well. But here's a plant that's closely related to watercress. 
and in fact has the similar peppery uh, flavor of, of watercress, both in its leaves and especially in its flowers. And this is yet another ornamental plant. You may well be growing as an ornament, ornamental plant, but is in fact an incredible edible plant. You, these flowers, I would say, are one of the best choices as an edible flower in your salad mixes and elsewhere. Or just as a garnish as well. Great flavor. Just pluck the flowers and drop them in the salad. And when the, when the seed pods form in the early stage, you see the seed pods at the lower part of the slide, they can be pickled like capers. They make wonderful capers. And these are the seeds when they mature, they're quite large, very easy to, to grow. This is one of the herbs that is better grown from seed direct in the garden or in sown in pots that you're going to transplant uh, pot and all into the garden without dividing the seedlings. You don't divide these seedlings, so you plant them straight in. If you, if you divide them, then the seedlings will go right to flower and they won't produce much, much at all. There, some plants, uh, when they are, when the roots are disturbed, uh, uh, it triggers a, 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 a signal in the plant that says, it's it, an alarm signal actually that says, hey, our, we're under threat. Our roots are being damaged by, by this human that's dividing our roots, our plants up and, and damaging the roots as they divide them. So we're, we're under threat. So what do we do? What does the plant have to do? It has to reproduce itself. So what does it do? Instead of producing more leaves and getting bigger and bigger, it goes straight to seed, produces a couple of flowers and then dies. And you see that so often with plants, especially annual plants. Well, the, we're participants, Richter's are participants of the Herb of the Year program that is run by the International Herb Association. Every year they highlight a particular herb to be celebrated uh, for a full year. And it so happens in 2021, the Herb of the Year is parsley. And so we added to our catalog, if you go online to our website, you can download a catalog, you can order a paper version of a catalog, and you will see the various varieties of parsley that we offer, including a number of new varieties that we introduced this year. And this slide here encapsulates the three main types of parsley that we carry and that, uh, that can be found. On the left is the moss curled parsley we talked about right at the outset of the presentation. They are bred for the curly, attractive you know, uh, uh, curly leaves. They do have flavor, but it's not quite as strong as the one to the right, which is the plain leaf parsley, and also known as the Italian parsley. That is the one that Central Europeans and Southern Europeans always go to when they want to use fresh parsley in their cooking. This is the one to get. In the North and in the Central Europe, they have yet another type of parsley called root parsley, also known as Hamburg parsley. And you can see it has a large, elong, uh, large, um, um, large uh, root, something like a parsnip. And those large roots can be added, chopped and added to soups and stews, just like parsley or like potato. And that's how they are traditionally used in countries like Poland, in parts of Germany, in the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, and all of those Central European countries. The great thing about this plant is you can also use the tops of the plants, just like regular plain leaf parsley. So it's really two plants in one, a vegetable and the fresh herb parsley. And you can see traditional Central European herb uh, uh, stew with both uh, the root parsley and the freshly parsley uh, uh, added at, uh, at the last minute. 
leaf herbs like uh, uh, parsley are typically added at the very end of the cooking cycle because if you add it too early, the heat will expel the flavors and, uh, and you lose most of the flavors. So you typically add them towards the end of the cooking cycle. Now in 2021, we learned in doing my research on, on all the different types of parsley in, in, in preparation for the Herb of the Year celebration, I discovered this, this parsley that was developed in the 1980s behind the Iron Curtain at that time in Bulgaria. The researchers, uh, agricultural researchers were looking for ways of adding or, or introducing uh, disease resistance into parsley. They noticed that celery was typically quite resistant to some of the diseases that was bothering parsley. And it so happens that celery and parsley are very closely related. In fact, at one time, the botanists, the taxonomists, put them in the same genus, apium. And uh, so the Bulgarians took advantage of that and they crossed a leaf celery with a parsley and got this variety called pars uh, Festival 68. And it is mostly a, par a parsley. It has mostly the characteristics of a parsley, but has that hint of celery in it. And it's really a special and wonderful flavor. And it is to, to this day, still an important variety in Central Europe. And we're happy to introduce it to North America. And this is one of the parents, the leaf celery. We all are familiar with the stem celery that you find in the, uh, in the grocery markets and in the marketplace, uh, the vegetable markets. But the, the Romans and the Greeks, we know from the very, the oldest, the oldest uh, recipe book known to man was uh, a compiled recipe book put together by a uh, Roman German, his name was Apicius. And uh, he put together a whole series of uh, interesting recipes, principally Greek and Roman recipes. And this leaf celery, especially the seeds of it, were an important spice throughout all those recipes. I would, I would guess about 20% of the recipes feature the seeds of this particular leaf sour uh, in their recipe. Well, uh, this is, a, I guess it would be a, an abrupt ending, but I'm sure I've gone beyond the, my allotted time. So I, uh, I'm going to conclude with this picture of our catalog. This is the 51st, 51st year of the Richter's catalog. And you're all welcome to uh, go online at our website uh, and order a copy. Actually, it's probably best now. Uh, we're a little slow in getting the mailing out now because we're focused now so much on shipping plants and getting our plant orders out. Uh, so probably better just to download the catalog or just to go through our, our web catalog. Uh, but you will find uh, uh, hundreds or almost a thousand varieties of herbs available in seed, plant, and in dried herb form as well. And with that, I bring my talk to a close, and I'm more than happy to take questions. If anyone has questions, they're able to post them on the Q&A, and we'll um, forward them on to Conrad to answer. Quiet this evening. <laughs> I guess. I guess. <laughs> All right. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Uh, it was a uh, bit over. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Oh, I. Oh, oh here we go. It, it could have been my computer. I do have a few now. <laughs> oh, um, okay. okay. Here we go. Okay. So. First of all, a lot of thank yous, Conrad, for a very informative evening. Have come through the Q and A. Um, actually, that's what a lot of them are right now. 
We'll keep the line open for a few minutes. And, and at this point, what I'd like to do is, is hand it back over to Hans um, to say a few closing words. And I do see more questions coming in, Hans. So after that, we'll go back to some Q&A if that works. I, I think he's muted. I think he is too. <laughs> yes. Here I am. Thank you, Conrad, for what I'm going to just reiterate what, what many of the viewers and listeners are, are, are saying tonight for an excellent, uh, beautifully informative presentation. Wonderful. Uh, the information you. you provided us tonight on so many herbs and plants we know of, but may not know the this much puts in uh, put, and, and put in such good perspective has been wonderful. Um, this is a pr presentation that I personally would like to uh, hear again. And congratulations on your 51 years. And we look forward to being with you for another 51 years. What was the name of that plant that keeps you alive? <laughs> Sage. Sage, yes, it is. Uh, I'll give okay. it back. Before we sign off, I'm, I'm just, let me just do this. Uh, I'd just like to thank the Whitby and Bloom for bringing Conrad to, to us tonight. Uh, what a great uh, uh, presentation we've had to enjoy. And uh, just a reminder that uh, next month we do have one that takes us into the vegetable area with Beyond Beef Steak, Wednesday, uh, May the 26th, and uh, Mark Cullen will be the presenter. But let's go back to some more questions for Conrad. Great, because they're coming in now. So um, a few are asking just first about the business, about um, ordering online and picking up in person. Is that available through the business? Uh, yes, uh, we are actually open, uh, despite the fact that uh, we're in another uh, stay-at-home uh, emergency. And that's because we are a supplier of uh, plant material and seeds to the, to the industry, to the herb industry. And so we have been considered uh, essential. And so we are opening. Of course, we're uh, observing all, all the uh, social distancing and, and uh, COVID uh, protocols and uh, certain limitations on number of people can be in the store at any one time, but we are open and people are coming out. You can also right. order online and uh, for pickup for those who prefer to do it that way. Uh, you can order uh, for shipping. We are shipping, uh, we're in the mid, we've already begun shipping throughout uh, Ontario. Um, I must say, however, though, that uh, many of our plants are already sold out. Uh, for online, uh, certainly all of the, the packs and the plug trays, those are all sold out right now, but we still have a pretty good selection available. Uh, probably be the best since most of you are not too far away from us is the front, you know, come on out uh, on a, you know, we're still open seven days a week. Great. I do have someone that's asking about most of the plants in your presentation, do they require full sun? Uh, good question. Thank you for uh, reminding me to speak about that. I didn't speak a whole lot about how to grow these plants. Uh, but uh, most of the herbs that we're familiar with from, you know, from Europe are, lo are sun lovers. Some can tolerate a bit of shade, uh, but for the most part, you know, when you think of rosemary, thyme, uh, when you think of chives, when you think of uh, basil, and on and on, all of those you know, common culinary herbs, they, are herb, they love the full sun. The more sun they get, the more intense the flavors are. <laughs> and the reason why the flavors get more intense is that they're producing more of those essential oils. And as one point I, 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 I didn't mention, and I, and I think this is a good opportunity to bring this in, um, you know, the reason why so many of these plants are medicinal or have health-given benefits is because these plants for millions of years have had to fight off uh, 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 pests, bacteria, insects, uh, viruses, and other predators that are feeding off of these plants. And they have developed a whole, a, a wide, range of tactics to defend against these things. So, and 
they produce these what they what we call scientists call secondary metabolites. These are these are compounds that the plant doesn't actually need for its normal growth. It doesn't. They, these aren't compounds that help build leaves or build stems or build flowers or seeds or any of that stuff. They're principally chemical warfare defending against these uh, organisms that are trying to feed off of them. And it so happens that many of these substances are, uh, we have learned as humans, we have learned can be used for our benefit, for bacterial disease, for viral disease. We have many plants that are known to be antiviral. So, uh, the, so I think it's really important to appreciate that, that these plants are, are giving us uh, the gifts that are coming from millions of years of evolution. Great. I have a few others, Conrad. Um, now we'll go the opposite direction. Are there any herbs you could recommend that grow well in the shade? Uh, yes, there are some, there certainly are some herbs that do well in shade and must actually grow in shade. Certainly the important uh, woodland plants that many people are starting to grow now. In fact, this year we launched a project called uh, Kine Gegu, which is, uh, um, uh, which is uh, uh, a project to encourage people to grow or to preserve the important woodland medicinal plants which are actually under threat right now. I mean, yeah, I'm principally speaking of plants like ginseng, golden seal, trillium. Trillium is a medicinal plant, many people don't know. Bloodroot, liverwort, and many others. Black cohosh, blue cohosh, all of these are woodland plants that love the shade. And, uh, uh, and, and so we're encouraging people to to plant these on, on their property, to help preserve these plants, because these plants are under threat now because of A, habitat destruction, but also because of overuse in the herbal trade markets. So those ones are definitely shade plants, but there are also uh, other plants that will tolerate shade that you could grow. Certainly the mints will do fine in partial shade. Uh, sweet woodruff is an excellent shade plant. Nice ground cover can be used in, in a special dish or a drink, a traditional drink uh, of the spring called Mayaboli from, uh, from the Black Forest region of Germany. And uh, there are quite a few other uh, 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 shade loving herbs. The uh, lovage that I talked about would do quite happily in a, in a partial shaded area. And there are many others. Great. Um, I have someone asking if you have any tips and tricks for growing cilantro, because it does take a long time. <laughs> okay, cilantro is one of our, one of the herbs that we worked on, I didn't talk much about it, but uh, is one of the herbs that we worked on, because uh, back in those 70s and early 80s, cilantro, first of all, is the same as coriander, it's the same species. But like tomatoes, there are many different varieties. Now, what was known for the longest time was the seed of the, of the coriander as, a, as coriander spice. And so the varieties grown in those days were all varieties that immediately went to flower and immediately produced seeds because they want, you wanted a lot of seeds. You didn't care about the leaves. In fact, many people, especially those of uh, British origin from the British Isles, uh, uh, have a certain gene that detects a soapy characteristic of, of coriander. And they actually, uh, I found that many people of, 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 uh, from, from Britain, uh, when I showed them, uh, coriander and said that, hey, this is a great uh, fresh herb that you can fresh chop and put in your salads. Uh, they turned their nose. They hated it. They hated the soapy scent. Not everybody has the gene that smells the soapiness 
of, of uh, cilantro. But it so happens that people of, uh, of South Asia, of Southern Europe, and Latin America do not or have a less preponderance of that gene and, and enjoy cilantro, the leaf part of it, rather than the seed part. Well, the reason why I'm telling you all of this is because those early varieties were all about the seed production and were terrible for the seed, for the leaf production. But as the, the interest started to grow for cilantro, the leaf form, we couldn't find it. We couldn't find it anywhere. And uh, it turned out that uh, uh, a, uh, one of our customers, one of our commercial growers got wind of, uh, uh, got, got a cap, uh, and uh, managed to find some seeds of a Chinese cilantro and started to grow it on his farm and he shared his seeds with us. And that's what we, we introduced to our catalog as cilantro. So, I'm mentioning all of this because, first of all, you have to get the right variety if you want cilantro. You have to get a slow bolting variety, one that doesn't go to flower as easily or as quickly. And you need to sow it directly into the garden. Don't try to transplant it. The moment you transplant it, like Dill and many other of the plant members of that same family, the parsley family, if you transplant, you're disturbing the roots and the plant was, sends a signal and goes straight to flower. So sow it directly into the garden, get the right variety. If you get the right variety, cilantro is actually an easy plant to grow. One of the easier herbs to grow. Great, I have three last questions here. Um, just at the store, if you have any Asian herbs that you carry, turmeric, uh, kaffir lime, are you carrying any of those this year? Sorry, uh, which uh, we do um, have a lot of Asian herbs. Yes. So, okay. which one was it? Uh, the turmeric and um, ca pardon my uh, pronunciation, kaffir lime, kaffir lime. Kaffir lime. Um, well, okay. Well, let's talk about turmeric. <laughs> um, uh, turmeric, of course, is uh, uh, everyone knows it as a, an important Indian spice, and it has a, a growing appreciation for its health benefits. It is, an, it is a very powerful anti-inflammatory. So people are using it for various anti-inflammatory uh, uh, problems, including you know, inflamed joints and inflamed tissues and that sort of thing. But in, 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 of course, in South Asian cuisine, turmeric is used in practically every curry mix. Turmeric is, is a challenge to grow, frankly. You can grow it, and we do occasionally have plants, but it's not one that we reliably have plants of. And it's a funny plant because it requires intense heat before it actually sprouts from its tubers. So we find that it'll grow, it'll grow happily in, in our soil, in our pot, in our greenhouse, but you won't see any foliage, any growth for until late June and until July. And then all of a sudden the shoots start growing up. So uh, turmeric does require a little bit more effort, but it can be grown. Once you get it to sprout, you can plant it out into the garden in the warmest part of the, sunniest part of the garden, protect it from the cool winds, uh, maybe in a south facing wall that's maybe a light colored, so it's reflecting light on it. And, and it's kept away from the cold winds, uh, you can get turmeric to grow and, 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 and spread and then in the fall, uh, harvest the roots. So I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite make out what the other plant was. Uh, it's called K-A-F-F-I-R lime, kaffir lime. Oh, kaffir lime, okay. Kaffir yes. lime. <laughs> yes, uh, we don't have it at this point. It is one that we are actively looking for and we did have it at one point. The challenge with Kaffir lime is that you need to get fresh seeds. And it's a real challenge to get fresh seeds from where this plant grows. This plant is principally grows in Thailand. It's an, it is a citrus. It is the, the, the incredibly scented leaves, of course, are important in Thai cuisine and, and South Asian cuisine, but the seeds lose their viability very, very quickly. So by the time we get the seeds from, from Thailand, 
the seeds are already dead. So we've had a real chance. We've had it in our catalog uh, over the years, but currently we don't have it. Sorry. Okay. Do you have any, do you recommend uh, any of the easiest herbs to grow from seed? What would you recommend as the easiest ones to grow well, from a seed? Okay, certainly I mentioned the cilantro definitely is easy to grow. Uh, summer savory. Savory is known as the bean herb. It is a perfect complement to any bean dish. Why? Because it, it stimulates the digestive system. And we all know that beans are a little bit hard to digest. So perfect complement. You're eating something with the beans uh, that, that actually stimulates the bile and the, the whole digestive system to, to, to break down the bean protein. So yes, savory is a perfect example of one to grow. Uh, you can sow basil directly in the garden. Thyme can be grown directly very easily. It's a thyme though is a very small seed. So you gotta be careful not to sow it too deeply into the ground. What we recommend with some for the very fine seeds, that thyme seeds are uh, sort of like the size of a poppy seed. So what we recommend is that you sow it on the surface of an, an, a, 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 even a clean uh, rake surface Sow it in rows on the surface, press it down, and maybe very, very lightly cover it with maybe a sifted soil, and then water it. Uh, but uh, certainly thyme, basil, marjoram, uh, cilantro, fennel, dill, all of those are very easy to grow from seeds. Great. We're almost down to our last two minutes. So I have two quick final questions. Um, someone already bought plants from you last month and they're keeping them alive, but they wondered if you had a, a recommendation to planting in our garden and then quote new gardeners. So any feedback there? Okay. Well, for most of the European herbs that we're familiar with, you know, the basils and the, the rosemaries and thymes and so on, lavender is another one. These are herbs that A, need a lot of sun, but also don't like wet feet. So they like good drainage. Even something like French tarragon, we find likes good drainage. If, they, if you have a heavy clay soil, which you do find towards the southern parts of Durham region, then you best to add sand to your soil and, and if possible, to position your garden a little bit on a slope so that you have good water drainage away from the root. That also helps to uh, these plants to survive the winter because what happens with the perennial herbs is that if their feet are wet over winter, the frost heaving causes the plants to lift up from the soil. And that's actually what kills the plant. One of the reasons why the plants uh, these herbs die out over the winter. So, so you want lots of sun, you want good drainage, and you don't have to be terribly worried about the, uh, the fertility of the soil. Many of these herbs, I've seen, for example, Greek oregano growing in a pile of gravel. Can you believe it? They're quite happy and relatively poor soil. Okay. And the last question for the evening, and for those that have some you think about afterwards, please feel free to email events at whitby.ca, and we'll make sure that we reach out and get the right answer for you. So our final question, your catalog shows caterpillar plant. Are the caterpillars and leaves edible? They are. They're, I, they, they're definitely uh, uh, edible. That is the... Uh, the in the young fruits, um, they, they, it's a remarkable plant. Definitely you should, if, if nothing else, go to our website and take a look at the picture of this caterpillar plant. So yes, it is edible. It, is, it doesn't have a, an exceptional flavor. That in fact doesn't have much of a flavor at all. It's more of a novelty plant and you add that to your salad, especially to someone that you, you know, you want to, maybe, maybe somebody you're not all that endeared with and you want to shock them and serve them a salad and put a caterpillar uh, fruit on the middle of their salad and let them and see what their reaction is. It's kind of fun. Great. And that's it for this evening and our questions. Thank you very much, Conrad.
Thank you, Hans. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. you.